So we've been spending some time looking at sort of political and legal developments as well as um, some of the military conflicts um, characterizing England during this period. This lecture is going to turn our attention to focus a little bit more on some economic changes. Um, as you can see from the dates here, this is a large swath of time, 1,000 to 1,200. So this is really a general overview of um, changes that happen over a considerable period of time. But by the time you get to 1200, society in England looks very different than it does in 1000 on a number of fronts. So um, this period, these changes that occur come under a number of different sort of terms. Sometimes you'll see commercial revolution. I don't like the term revolution. I think revitalization is even a little bit um, misleading because it suggests sort of like going picking up where things got left off at some point. And I think what we're really talking about is some really new developments here. So one of the things that happens is until around 1,000, 1,100, uh, England primarily has what we call a subsistence economy. So basically people live at a subsistence level. You're getting just enough to get by. Um, you produce enough to eat enough to feed your family through the year, that's pretty much it. There's no incentive to produce more um, for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, obviously though, if you're sort of at, living at a subsistence standard, you're very vulnerable to any sort of interruptions of um, sort of agricultural cycles, um, military um, conflict can interrupt a community. So that makes these populations a lot more um, vulnerable. The commercial economy, which is what emerges over this period of time, all of a sudden there is an incentive to actually produce more. There's more buying and selling of goods. There's more buying and selling of agricultural produce. So if you do produce more of any sort of product, you can then um, take it to a market and you can uh, sell it. And um, then obviously that uh, stands to benefit your family's economy. So what we start to see too is the emergence of these markets, concentrated markets, specialization of labor, um, individuals then who uh, are not engaged necessarily in um, producing food, they have another trade, they're doing something differently. And so um, an end to this exclusively agrarian society that really marks England up until about a thousand. And you can see from some of these contemporary images, some of the um, activities uh, that sort of drive the economy. So this is harvest time. You can see the women along with the men sort of all out in the fields collecting the grain. Similarly, um, some other depictions. So you can see on the one side, this is sort of an oven sort of communal ovens uh, so that people can bake bread is obviously instead of just sort of uh, baking bread in your own home is going to allow you to increase the volume you're able to produce and then mills harnessing sort of technology um, more effectively so instead of um, as we saw this tendency to grind grain with just sort of um, uh, with a quernstone, all of a sudden you're using that wind technology so you can grind things. It's much less labor intensive and you can accomplish much more in a shorter period of time. So why is it that around a thousand you start to see some of these changes? It's really a convergence of a variety of different factors and phenomena. So first and foremost, the end of all these invasions by um, the time of the Normans, you have sort of stability. People can really sort of focus on um, moving forward as opposed to just sort of defending what they have. And obviously the disruption caused by invasions is gonna slow down economic progress. You also start to see the feudal stability become uh, the feudal system becoming more stable. Some of the changes that they're making, regularization of administration. You do see population growth. Some of this happens in response to some of these changes because they're producing more, so nutrition levels grow up. Um, but some of it also then, in turn, causes things like uh, deforestation, pulling down forests so you could build more uh, or so you could plant more food. We do know that around this period, there is um, a slight, slight increase in temperature, but that is enough to improve the growing season. So you have a longer growing season and you have a slightly warmer growing season. And that um, plays very well into allowing these peasants to increase the amount they're able to produce. 
and also some technological advances. These are things that we wouldn't necessarily think about that really do dramatically improve um, their ability to, um, to cultivate the land. So like mills and things, but also a horse collar. So figuring out how to harness a horse with a collar instead of just a rope around its neck so that it can pull a plow without collapsing its windpipe. Things like stirrups. Um, allow people to stay on horseback a little bit um, more easily. Um, shoeing horses to protect the hooves of horses. So all of these sort of combined then um, are part of what sort of fuels um, this significant change. So in terms of the sort of emerging economy, you have a number of people who are engaged. Um, first, you have the Jewish community. Remember, William brought um, at least a small number of Jews to England after the conquest. Then they have um, commercial contacts from the places where they were previously from in France. Um, also, just because of uh, the sort of isolation of the Jewish community within the larger Christian population, they tended to sort of more actively make connections between um, people in different lands, uh, intermarriage. So um, these all uh, made it possible for them to have commercial contacts. We also see um, usury laws. So these are laws that say Christians cannot lend money to other Christians and charge interest. Um, this is something that was considered prohibited by the Catholic Church, but clearly there was this need uh, for money to circulate within society. So Christians couldn't lend money to other Christians, but Jews could lend money to other Christians. And so this was sort of a way around um, that uh, prohibition that really brought Jews into the commercial economy. They also were not allowed to own property because of feudal law. They weren't allowed to practice viticulture, um, uh, wine growing, and so they did have sort of a restricted opportunities um, because they were non-Christian, and so this sort of drove them into different sort of um, economic activities. Unfortunately, those same economic activities that provide um, some sort of uh, opportunity eventually sort of work against them and we'll talk about sort of the increasing marginalization of the Jews within England and ultimately their expulsion. After around the 12th century you do start to see more and more Christian merchants active in this exchange particularly markets concentrated in northern Italy in part because of that Mediterranean um, access but also Flanders the low countries this is sort of modern day Belgium becomes very active this is the cloth hall in Bruges which was built during the late Middle Ages so kind of a reflection of um, the amount of revenue and the importance of the economy and then this obviously just sort of illustrates the various trade routes so they're really moving goods all across Western Europe Eastern Europe, North Africa, into the markets in um, uh, sort of the Middle East. And then obviously there would have been a whole nother set of um, routes leading of even further east into China. So you start to see agricultural specialization. Um, so the image here, sort of a local market, someone who's um, deciding to focus all their attention on either uh, brewing beer or on um, um, making bread, which then they can sell at these markets for revenue. And then the other, um, the illustrated manuscript you can see in the initial here, this is a monk. In particular, monks became very active in, um, the, in producing beer, and a lot of Trappist monks still are, particularly in places like Belgium. Um, and so they are very active in um, sort of specializing in the production of various goods, which then they're able to sell as these markets emerge. And the barter economy, so exchanging goods for goods, becomes increasingly obsolete. We start to see the minting of coins instead of being sort of large coins that were more um, the embodiment of wealth. So the coin itself was what you valued as opposed to the coin as a medium of exchange. If you're really going to use coins to sort of exchange back and forth, they need to be smaller, they need to be lighter um, so that you can actually move across um, uh, places with them and this also then opens the door for increasingly the accumulation of physical wealth so wealth in the form of money um, and so instead of being sort of a symbol of wealth money actually becomes um, a, a tool to exchange wealth 
So one of the things that really alters society and the landscape as a result of some of this change is the growth of towns. Um, they're still very limited by modern standards, but as you can see here, this is actually a depiction of, of Paris. Um, a lot of these towns then have sort of the central original point um, of origin, but then they start to sort of spread out and eventually um, are encircled by fortified walls. So commercial districts within these towns. So um, sort of on the top of this map, you can kind of read Leal. Leal is the marketplace of France or of Paris. And so it would have been a huge sort of open market where people would have brought goods from all across uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. A lot of the times the center of these towns would be a cathedral, so the seat of the bishop or a castle. In Paris, you actually have two. You have the Cathedral of Notre Dame, um, which you can see in the center of the Seine. And then you also have um, the royal palace or the residence because these households would have lots and lots of people sort of staffing them, they would have been obviously um, uh, the source of a lot of demand. So you can bring your grain, you can bring various goods, you can bring your beer and your wine, and you know there's someone who wants to buy it. And so around these markets, you start to see um, a new sort of type of individual. They're not a peasant, they don't work the land, they're not a noble, um, a new sort of group of people that live in towns or burgs that we call burgers, or in France, um, the French equivalent is bourgeoisie. So these are town dwellers. So the example of London, um, eventually London around 1300 has a population of about 30,000 people. Um, 139 churches across that amount of space. So the bells would have been ringing constantly. They also have about 354 taverns and even more ale shops. Um, so you can't brew beer yet because you don't have the hops. So what you brew is you brew ale. It isn't, it can't, you can't preserve it for as long. And so these would be sort of pop-up shops. We also see in London during this time, um, the emergence of sort of ways to just maintain such a large population. So they have um, sanitation workers. Um, they do have sort of open sewers that go along the center of most of the streets so that um, all the sewage uh, and any sort of um, garbage that collects can be washed away or washed into the Thames. Um, you do also have sort of the first public latrine in London. Um, otherwise people, you don't have any indoor plumbing, so people use sort of um, chamber pots and then they take it to sort of um, public latrines and they empty them there. So as you have this denser population, you start to have challenges associated with that. This is um, York. This is in the north of England. There are um, a few streets in York that date to a degree. They've obviously been restored a bit, but the date to the late medieval period. And I, what I like about this is um, you can see how they build up and out to maximize the space. Um, and also though how narrow these streets would have been um, the size of the streets is sort of dictated by the needs of the population. You at best have maybe horses, maybe some carts going up and down the street, but you don't need the sort of wide thoroughfare that you're going to need um, later. And you can also see sort of the center of the street has obviously been filled in. At one point that would have been sort of an open rut where the sewage would have gone through. As people start to specialize more and more in terms of occupations, we start to see the emergence of something called a guild. A guild is essentially an association of individuals um, occupied in the same trade and um, particularly artisan guilds, so people who um, make stuff. Um, so cabinet makers, um, people engaged in woodworking, people engaged in textile production, um, uh, either uh, dyeing the textile or weaving the textiles. Um, also people engaged in various trades like um, butchers. You at one point there is talk of sort of a Protestants guild, um, a beggars guild, though these would have been much less formal. Um, so the purpose of the guild is actually initially to limit competition to make sure that everyone who is a cabinet maker can make a living making cabinets. So you don't want competition that then sort of drives down prices and also to ensure quality. So there would have been sort of a set price 
for particular products across uh, England. And that had to, then that particular product had to meet certain standards. So there would have been people who went in whose job was quality control. They actually have people like beer tasters, ale tasters. So their job is to taste the ale within the community and make sure it's up to standards. So this is a long process to become a full member of the guild or a master. So you start out as an apprentice. Most apprentices would have started out at maybe like 11, 12. Um, your family would have come to an agreement with someone in a particular occupation, they would take you on. They would also take you into their homes um, so that you could learn all aspects of this trade. Eventually, after doing some of the more sort of menial tasks around um, the shop, then you sort of move to the status of journeyman where you actually are producing um, whatever it is you are apprenticed to produce. And then around 20, 21, in your early 20s, you would apply to the guild for acceptance as a master. So let's say you are a cabinet maker, you would make a cabinet. This would be sort of your master piece. Uh, so obviously there's artist guilds too, right? Which is where a lot of this terminology um, you've encountered before. So you would make your sort of um, your cabinet that exemplifies your skills. All of the other members of the guild would examine it. If they felt that the quality was good enough, you then pay fees and you become a full member of that guild. You can then open up your own shop, employ your own apprentices and journeyman, um, and sort of establish uh, yourself within the community. They also had a lot of social and religious functions. So the guild would have had um, feast days that they celebrated. They would have um, participated in various sort of religious festivals and parades. Um, they also were a safety net. So every member of the guild paid in dues. And then let's say someone died, um, you take a sort of collection of those dues and you give it to the widow to help with burial costs or just to kind of help her make the transition um, after the death of her husband. In terms of members, um, most of these guilds were male dominated, though some particularly sort of in the textile guilds did have female members. Um, but really when you talk about that, you're talking about the guild itself, the masters of the guild would have been predominantly male, but because most of these businesses were attached to homes, there would have been a lot of overlap. So for example, it would have been the master's wife who was responsible for overseeing the apprentices, making sure they had food, making sure they had clothing, making sure they abided by house rules. She also maybe would have been the person who would have been um, sort of selling the product in the market. So um, there is some gender distinction here, um, but uh, for the most part on, the, on a daily basis, it would have been both men and women who were active. Jews could not be members of the guild um, because ultimately these are religious institutions. And then increasingly, even for Christians, as we move through the end of the Middle Ages, they start to become more and more restrictive in terms of making that, um, that move from journeyman to master. So increasingly, as they're trying to stymie competition, the guilds become a way of sort of keeping people out. So then instead of this inevitable progression to a master, a lot of people get stuck in the journeyman stage. And by the end of the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, the guild is no longer really seen as sort of something that encourages opportunity. It's actually seen as something that sort of stymies opportunity. And so this association between um, the trade or your occupation and your place of, uh, of uh, residence is I think really well demonstrated by this map of medieval London. So you can see Bread Street, Vintry Street. So obviously Bread, um, Vintry, that would have been where a lot of wine sellers lived. Um, at the very bottom, Old Fish Street. So that would be where the fish market was. Um, so uh, a lot of these different sort of trades would have been associated with different places of the city. And then that sort of is reflected in a lot of these old names. You also have the uh, emergence of merchant guilds. These are individuals whose primary uh, sort of profession is obviously involved in trade, buying and selling of goods. Um, as trade becomes more common, feudal lords realize that it's an important source of revenue. And so they establish sort of tolls. If you're moving goods from one place or another, you often have to pay a toll. This would have been really common as you enter a city. Um, 
And then also sort of the feudal taxes or revenues that were associated with that land before it really became more urbanized. What a lot of these merchant guilds want to do is sort of get rid of those day-to-day -day tolls and taxes um, and take on more autonomy, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of feudal lords. So what you start to see is a process of negotiation where um, leading merchants within the city sort of form this um, body and then they uh, sort of negotiate with um, whoever has feudal authority over them to sort of purchase a town charter. And so this would have conveyed a lot of rights to self-governance, their own courts. Um, you also see them in a lot of instances Instead of the daily tolls and taxes, they just pay an annual lump sum to the feudal lord. So they continue to collect the taxes, but they collect it themselves. Um, and these really is, it really is astonishing to kind of see this movement across Europe. It really happens first in Italy, but it also help, happens elsewhere where a lot of these larger cities, um, especially like London, like York, manage to really establish a, a fair degree of this sort of self-governance. Now, obviously, it's only the wealthiest members of the community, the elite within the community who have a say in this, um, but it definitely is sort of a move towards more, more um, sort of um, a, a distribution of powers. So what's the outcome of all these changes? By 12, 1250, what we do see is a redistribution of the population. Instead of the vast majority of people in England living in the countryside, you now have a fair percentage of them living in these urban centers. Um, obviously, a resurgence of commerce that was much more prevalent perhaps during uh, the Roman period, um, but now is, is sort of moving much more towards sort of modern trends. The emergence of the profit economy. So the profit economy is what we're all very familiar with, replacing the subsistence economy. The goal is not just to survive for most people, it's to actually sort of increase one's wealth, increase one's standing. And then obviously this idea of professional specialization, more and more people sort of engaged in particular occupations, particular trades, the production of a particular good, um, which then they can sort of develop an expertise on um, and sell for a profit.